Um, I definitely want to take the opportunity to introduce the next speaker. Um, this gentleman is someone who I've met before um, and use his, his platform for learning. Uh, his, his, um, the title of his talk is uh, Journey Before Destination. Um, our speaker, John Calhoun, uh, the creator of Gopher Sizes. Uh, for many of us, uh, learning to program is a means to an end. We want to get a job to get paid or to build a specific app. The end result is that we often try to skip to the end. We want to build a modern modern apps or write idiomatic code from the from the start, and we don't want to waste time learning the wrong way of doing things. So, so in this talk, John explains the importance of resisting the temptation to try to skip ahead and why it's important to focus on the on the learning journey rather than the specific destination. Um, so without that, I mean, with that, I get handed back to Angelica. Journey Before Destination. Many of you are probably going to recognize the title. It is an ideal from the Stormlight Archive book series written by Brandon Sanderson. And in the books, it basically means that how you do something is more important than the end result. That your journey to get there matters more than the actual destination itself. In the books, it's mostly referring to morality. So whether or not performing some evil acts to achieve some good results is justifiable. But as I read the books, all I could really think about was how this also applies to other things, such as learning to code. I guess you could kind of say if I'm a nerd for that, but in my head, I feel like people get so focused on the destination and where they're going that they forget about how much value there is in the journey itself. And that's going to be the focus of today's talk. Um, how much value there is in the journey, why you shouldn't be skipping to the destination, and we're gonna talk about how to make that journey more enjoyable and more effective. So before we get started, a little bit about me so you understand why I'm the person giving this talk. My name is John Calhoun. I am a GoTime panelist. So GoTime is a podcast where we bring on different guests and we talk about different things related to Go and we try to keep it educational and entertaining for our audience. I also create Go courses so here are some of the ones I've created. I'm constantly working on new ones. You've probably heard of Gopher Sizes before you'll hear of any of the other, other courses there um, because Gopher Sizes is free and it targets kind of the beginner to intermediate range developer where you've started to get the basics of Go down and you're writing some basic code, but you need some practice problems, some exercises to sort of help you, um, you know, level up those skills along the way. I also write a Go newsletter and the newsletter is just intended to teach people something new about Go every week, roughly. Sometimes it's every two weeks. And this is just an example. Um, I have wrote a crash course on Go interfaces and shared that with my mailing list. And then we kind of built on that throughout the next couple emails as we looked at different ways interfaces can be used and eventually looked at some harder problems that required a pretty good understanding of interfaces. I also write on my website. Uh, I write tutorials, um, whatever they want to call them, blog tutorials, whatever. Um, I write those on my website. And most of the time, the things in my newsletter will end up getting on the website as well. But this is how I got started. So there's a lot of stuff there that isn't in the newsletter as well. So these are just different little tutorials that'll teach you something if you're looking to learn some specific thing. And lastly, I'm working on a Go book. I don't really have a lot to share about this, but I'm working with a publisher to create a book related to Go. I say all this to say that I have a lot of experience helping people in a lot of different ways. And I've also interacted with a lot of people who are learning to code who come from a variety of different backgrounds. And this has sort of allowed me to really get an understanding of where people make mistakes, what techniques do and don't work, and I want to kind of share what I believe to be some good ways to go about learning so that you can hopefully kick off your way, your journey to learning how to code and be a little bit more effective and productive with it. Learning to code is a means to an end. For most of us, learning to code is, is something we do to make money and pay the bills. That isn't to say that we don't enjoy it or that we wouldn't do it in our spare time, but it is a way that we you know, a means to some sort of end. 
And that could even be if you want to start your own business and you're trying to build the technology for it, coding is still a means to an end. It's not something that you're just going to sit there and do forever because you enjoy it. You're trying to achieve some goal. Because of this, we often try to skip to that end because we don't want to waste time getting there. We want to build those modern web applications without learning about how apps were historically made, or we want to write the clean idiomatic code without ever needing to learn how to refactor um, and, and writing that ugly code to begin with. We want to know how to structure our applications without having to figure that out as we go. We just want somebody to tell us the correct way to do it and we want to move forward. We just don't want to waste time feeling like we were learning the wrong way to do things. We want to focus on what gets us paid and move on. I think it is a mistake to rush to the end. Now that seems counterintuitive. You're probably thinking if I know I'm going to use this technology on the job or technology skill, whatever you want to replace there. Um, and you know that you can learn that technology now, isn't it best just to focus solely on learning that technology? And I would say no, um, focusing solely on that is a mistake. And the reason I say that is because you cannot write the code you will in five years without the experience you're going to gain along the way. Rushing to the end and focusing solely on these technologies and skills you expect to use in five years is a mistake because rushing almost always skips all that experience entirely, or at best you kind of skim it and have a, you know, a basic understanding of all the different things you would have learned in those five years, but you don't really have a true understanding of it. So some examples, you need the knowledge and experience of writing bad code to really understand what makes code clean or idiomatic or, or easily maintained code. But without actually seeing some bad code, it's really hard to appreciate what makes something good, clean code. Another example is that you need to understand the trade-offs between different code structures to really appreciate which one is going to be a good fit. And this is a question that comes up all the time in Go, is how do I structure my applications? And it's hard because people want you to tell them one specific way, like put you know, these files here and these files here, and that's how all your code is going to be structured. But the reality is, different structures make sense for different size teams, for different projects, and for a bunch of different you know, approaches. Uh, th there are a lot of projects I have where all the code is in one single directory because the project is small enough and it's only me or me and one other person working on it, so it works really well. But then there's also bigger projects where that would never work at all. And trying to explain that to people can be challenging, but the truth is you need to understand the trade-offs to decide which one is best for your project because when you start breaking it into a bunch of different packages, it does require more planning, more thinking, and more code to sort of connect those pieces together. Another example is that you need to attempt to write untestable code, or maybe not attempt to, you need to write untestable code to really appreciate what makes code testable. So if you only start with the testable code, you'll see that it's testable, but you won't really get what they're saying when they say this is easy, easy to test or it's testable code until you actually start writing code that isn't testable and then it's going to start clicking. Oh, I see how they changed these things to make it easier for them to actually test the thing they cared about. So rather than rushing to the end, we should focus on making learning fun and productive, understanding these trade-offs that we can make along the way, and building the lasting skills that are going to allow us to pick up any different tool or technology or programming language as we become more senior developers. So that's the goal of this talk, is just to discuss how you can be more effective at learning and you know, different approaches that I think are going to help you. First, learning to code shouldn't suck. I know that sounds obvious, but a lot of people will bang their head off the wall just trying to get through something, whether it's a tutorial or whatever else, they'll just keep banging their head off the wall thinking, if I just push through this, eventually I'll become a developer. And that's not a good way to learn. Go ask somebody that you know who's a developer, you know, preferably somebody who's a little bit more experienced at this point, ask them how they learn to code. And chances are they're going to maybe smile a little bit and tell you about some interesting project that they worked on or some hacky little project that they dove into and they had no real idea they were going to be a developer but it was just something they enjoyed and they just kept going at it whether it is a magazine that they got every week that had little code snippets that you could have a game in and you could code the game and then they would tweak it to sort of see well if i change this variable how does the game work from that point or maybe it was a musician who wanted to share his music and he decided to 
uh, you know, write a website or build a website using Flash or some other technology. And, you know, they dove into it, they started learning these things, and eventually they discovered that they wanted to be a developer. There are countless stories like this that I know of, but very rarely do I hear somebody tell me about a sucky grind that they hated. They just pushed through these tutorials, it was an awful experience, but eventually they became a developer. And the reason I think this matters is because the developers who get a project they like, or you find something that they really enjoy, they will code for longer hours, they won't give up when they get frustrated with bugs, and they won't be tempted to just quit and go watch TV or do something else instead. So all of these things basically allow them to really stick with it. And even if they're not using the technology or the tools that they end up using on the job five years later, they allow them to learn general skills along the way. They learn logical reasoning skills, just general development skills, and all of these things will eventually help them become a de better developer, especially because they're really enjoying what they're doing. Another way to think of this is that it is a marathon, not a sprint. So you might be able to bang your head against the wall and force yourself through tutorials for a while, but eventually it's going to stop working. And you need a plan that's going to last for the long haul because you need something to last this whole marathon. So part of this is discovering what you love. At U.S. universities, I don't know if this is the same everywhere, but I kind of assume it is, they are designed so that students can change their major within the first few years, usually the first two years, without any major setbacks. So if somebody comes in studying math, they can decide, oh, I really like this computer science class I took. Can I pursue computer science as a major instead? Or maybe you go in thinking that you're going to be a computer science major and you discover that you really like physics and want to build ro rockets and that a lot of the things overlap because you still use computers or something with the physics stuff. And that's cool. You can go do that. All of the early gen eds and the classes that you'll take are kind of designed to allow this as well. They are designed so that you get a little bit of taste of everything and then you dive into your specific focus for the last two years you're there. And I think with coding, wandering should be encouraged as well. So when you get hyper-focused on just learning the things for your major, if you're at a university or with coding, if you get hyper-focused on the technologies and the tools that you think you're gonna use on the job, you don't explore these other topics and you don't find the things that are interesting, but then you also don't really understand uh, what else is out there and what other approaches there are to problems. So some examples of, or that I've seen at least, of this happening where people dive into it is, I've talked to some people who thought they were gonna go in and build backend code. They were gonna write APIs for web servers, and that's what they really thought they were gonna do. But as they were doing it, they kind of discovered that they really loved building UIs. They loved JavaScript, and they loved seeing these visual feedback and creating components that had cool animations. And as a result, they just became front-end developers instead. And I think that's awesome that they found something that they really liked. I'm also, I've also seen people that thought they were going to get in build, into building web servers and, and building front ends or maybe being a full stack developer. But as they got into the DevOps side of things and making their server really resilient, they discovered that this is what they like. They like making a server so strong, a server setup, I should say, so resilient that Godzilla could come to New York and crush all the buildings and their, their website would still be up and running. And that's what some people like to do. So they dive into that. And that's awesome too. There's a ton of different fields you could end up going down, whether it's security, or you know, building web servers or building um, you know Internet of Things type devices, whatever it is, you can't really discover what that is without exploring a little bit and without allowing yourself to try out different technologies. So I'm not saying that you should try everything under the sun. Um, at some point at a university, you have to pick a major. And the same is true with coding. At some point, you need to pick a language or, or whatever else you're going to learn and stick with it. But that doesn't mean you can't taste a couple of them and, and get a feel for which ones might be good for you. And related to this is learning about alternative approaches. So when you're hyper focused on the end game and just learning one specific language or set of technologies or whatever it is, you generally don't wander enough to really understand or appreciate the approaches that other people take to problems. And as a result, when things need to change or when people want to apply some different technique to sort of solve a problem, you might not understand it or you might not appreciate the benefits of it. So I want to talk about an example. Um, you don't need to understand the code from this example, but I want to show it to you because it's a case where my experience with Go made it easier for me to understand some changes coming to the React world. So we're going to start with this React code. 
This is a friend status. So in React, you create these components and these essentially turn into the HTML you see in a web browser, um, but they're done with JavaScript in a way that you know, allows you to make them dynamic and interactive and you know, a little bit more uh, useful for users in a real application. The code I want to look at here is the component did mount and the component will unmount code. So what's happening here is the component did mount runs when the friend status is shown on the screen first and the component will unmount is run whenever that friend status is being pulled off the screen for some reason, whether it's the user going to a different page or whatever other reason. So the two things this does is the component did mount handles everything that needs to be done to register this component and make it work. So in this case, it's subscribing to the friend status so it can update it whether the person's online or offline. And then this could be separated by a bunch of code. And then we have the unmount code, which is for everything this component needs when it unmounts. And in this case, it's just unsubscribing from that status so that it doesn't have a memory leak. At some point, React introduced what's called hooks. And this use effect is one of the hooks. And in this, the way it works is you first run the code that is the equivalent of the component did mount section. So the code for rendering the component. And then the second bit here, is the cleanup code, the code that happens when the component is going to unmount. But rather than running it, we return a function that has all the cleanup code in it. And you don't really have to understand the benefits of this right now. Um, I can tell you the major benefit here is that all of this code gets grouped together inside of one use effect. So you don't have a bunch of code separating it and it's easier to manage and maintain. But for a lot of people, this change and the reasoning behind it was hard to understand Coming from Go, I've actually seen this pattern a lot and I've come to appreciate these benefits as I've been writing Go code. So because I had the experience in another language and this alternative approach taken, I was really able to appreciate and understand the changes coming to the JavaScript world as a result. And I think a lot of people just didn't have that background so it was harder to understand. But luckily the people creating React must have looked at other approaches or explored other approaches because they decided this was a good one to bring to React. Next up, we have planning isn't doing, or put another way, plan but don't over plan. So imagine you're taking a road trip. Think about how much planning you would do for this road trip, whether you're going cross country or you're driving from New York to Florida or whatever it is. Um, think about how much planning you would do and how much is too much planning. So in my mind, I'm thinking you might pull up some maps and you might plan a few stops along the way. So if I'm going from New York to California, I might decide I'm going to stop at Mount Rushmore and pick a couple major stops. Um, if I was hauling like a, an RV or a camper of some sort, I might use a gas app to sort of help me pick some good gas stations along the way because you have a really big trailer. Or if you know that you have family in a certain area, you might decide, okay, we're definitely going to stop here along the way. And even before you go, you might do some things like checking the pressure in your tires, you know, gassing it up, a couple things like that but chances are you aren't gonna take the entire engine apart and make sure every little thing's working fine. You're probably not going to you know, go into these really fine details of looking at every single gas station along the way and trying to predict um, when are we gonna need to stop to pee? When are we gonna need to get coffee? When are we gonna need to get gas? Um, or if you have kids, you can't predict those things, so you don't bother with it. In coding, I see people make this a related mistake. Um, they over plan so much that they try to plan every little small step along the way, when in reality, you can't plan for all those things. Um, you could research for weeks trying to figure out the best programming language for your career, for salary or whatever else. You could research for weeks looking for the courses that cover all the things that you think you're going to need to learn. And you know, you're thinking in your head, well, this is going to save me time because I'm not going to waste time learning the things I don't need. Um, you can just do all these things to try to make this optimal path, but in the end, you are just planning when you're doing this. You're not actually doing, you're not learning to code. And more often than not, just diving in or doing a little bit of planning and diving in is what's going to be the most productive. And this is a really easy pitfall to fall into because planning feels productive. Um, whenever you're looking up programming languages and, and trying them all out, as I said, you should do a little bit of exploring. And this feels productive because you're, you're jumping into these languages and you're really seeing a lot from it. But at some point, if you keep doing this over and over again and you never actually decide on, if it's university metaphor again, um, if you never decide on your major and focus on it, you never actually graduate and 
go on to get a job. So coding is the same. You need to eventually decide what you're going to focus on learning and you need to sit down and actually put in the effort to learn how to code and to learn those skills that you need along the way. Now, I know this is going to seem a little bit weird because some of you are thinking, don't you create courses? Don't you want people to research and decide that your course is the best one? And the truth is no. Um, I, I think my courses are great for a lot of people. I don't think they're necessarily the only way to learn how to code. I don't think you should sit around researching, re, uh, researching for days, trying to decide um, what the best course is. I think you should find the language or the things that you're enjoying and maybe sample some courses and the one that you enjoy, go ahead and dive in. And if that's my course, awesome. If it's not, I, that's fine too. I just want people to really jump in and learn how to code and get the enjoyment out of it that I do every day. And that I think is more important than somebody trying to find the right course or sorry, than trying to force people to use my courses um, and claiming they're the best course or they're the right course for everybody. So stop procrastinating, pick something and jump in and start learning from it. That's, that's one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give you today is that just if you've been planning for far too long, stop doing it and get out there and start doing the work. So related to this is practice, practice, practice. You can't just follow guides. You can't just read tutorials. You can't just watch videos and expect to learn how to code. All of the, like all of these are tools that are helpful, but at the end of the day, you need to actually be coding and putting in some time yourself to learn these skills. There's a bunch of resources this, for this as well. So go for sizes, as I mentioned earlier, was meant to be exercises that will help you go from just writing some sort of basic Go code to building all sorts of little tools. I think there's 20 different exercises there and we build something new or we build on something from a previous exercise in every single one. So you're constantly challenging yourself to do a little bit more, to read some more documentation and to apply different coding patterns as you go. But that doesn't mean you have to use Gopher sizes. There's exorcism, there's hacker rank, there's a custom project of your own. And there's just so many options out there that you really don't have an excuse not to get in there and practice. And if you're looking for another, um, another option when you're learning, it's to use an iterative approach. So what I mean by this is if you're taking a course, you can go back through the course, you know, iterate over the course a second time, but this time think about how you might build something similar to what's in the course or tutorial or whatever it is. Um, try to build something similar, but not quite the same. So if the course taught you how to build a Reddit clone, maybe go through and see if you can build a Twitter clone, which is close, but it's not quite the same. And it'll really force you to apply these skills you've learned along the way and make sure you really understand them. Um, in addition to that, you can also go back to code you've written and you can see if you can refactor it now that you understand different parts of coding and in different um, coding patterns, you can see if the code you wrote months ago or weeks ago or whatever could be refactored to be maybe more testable or cleaner or, or maintainable. Um, this also applies to the structure of your code. As you write more code um, and you're trying to figure out different app structures, maybe go back to some old code and think, would I change how I structured this now that I know a little bit more? Um, you can do this with tests, with with pretty much anything, whether it's your test, your app structure, just code in general, old courses, old tutorials, um, all of these things should be iterated on. I wouldn't use these resources as a one-time thing because you'll get way more out of them if you're willing to check them multiple times. You should also try to learn with others. The first thing I would say is join a study group if you can, whether that is a Slack study group or an in-person or a video chat one. In-person is probably hard right now, but um, whatever your options are, try to find some way to make yourself more accountable by learning with others. And even if it's not like an accountability thing, if you just have a group where you can ask each other questions and answer questions for other people, that's really going to help solidify what you're learning. Having to take a concept that you've learned and you understand and then teach it to somebody else will challenge your understanding and make sure you really get it better than almost anything else. And on the other side of that, if you're asking questions, you might learn more than what was originally taught in the tutorial or course or whatever you're going through, then you really, or if you misunderstood something, somebody might clarify it. And sometimes just seeing another person's perspective, if they, if they learn the, the material and they teach it to you in a slightly different way because that's how they understand it, sometimes that'll make it click for you. So all of these benefits of a study group are, are really, really valuable. And I would definitely recommend trying to learn with others if you can. Now, if you can't join a study group, there are other approaches. 
Uh, the first one is probably just to write a blog or notes or something like that, summarizing what you're learning. Now you could share it with friends or the internet or whoever you want, and people can interact with you a little bit, some or a little bit about what you're writing and what you're learning, but you're probably not going to get quite the same level of interaction. The one upside to this approach is that you can always refer to your own notes in the future and update them and, you know, sort of tweak them as you progress and learn more. And I do this all the time. I look back at things I wrote in the past, whenever I'm trying to refresh myself on a topic. And I think that it's awesome because usually I'm the best person to explain something to myself. So future me always appreciates something that, you know, present me writes. All of these things put together will make you a better developer. You're going to have a more well-rounded understanding of the tools and technologies you're using. You're going to be better suited to evaluate trade-offs and to decide which technologies are best for any specific set of circumstances. You know, rather than always using the same tools, you'll have the knowledge and the skills to decide, well, maybe this isn't the best tool for this job. Maybe I should check out this other thing. And I understand that taking this path of wandering a little bit, exploring a little bit, and not just jumping straight to the final technologies and tools you plan to end and just hyper-focusing on them. I understand this path is going to make it feel like you're not progressing as quickly, especially early on. But I just want you to remember, again, that learning to code is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, it's something you're going to continue to learn with, and you don't want to crash and burn halfway to the finish line. Um, learning a couple skills, getting a job, and then burning out a year or two later is, is not what you want to do. You want to have a solid foundation that's going to prepare you for a bright future as a developer. Thanks for listening to my talk. If you want to get in touch, uh, you can email me, john at calhoun.io, or I'm on Twitter at John Calhoun. Thanks.